It was then also that the economy started falling to pieces. The demise of the Soviet Union was not just a happening of the year 1991. It started in the 70s when the people understood there will be no communism. The dream of communism failing, the totalitarian moods, the severe control, the violence and the discipline also dissolved. And, bearing in mind that morals had not been developed, a catastrophe for the country was inevitable. What we call democracy can only exist under the conditions of the people being highly moral, cultured, developed, and informed. There were no such givens in the Russia of the 1990s. Now the situation is changing for the better hard and slow though the process is. If we take formal semblance to Western countries, then we are quickly developing along their pattern. But the problems with actual inner development cannot be ignored. Recently, I visited one of Moscow's prestigious central theaters. A modern theater with huge ancillary premises, but somehow it does not have many seats in the main auditorium. A bloated outer shell with little content inside. The same can be said of the goings-on during the play. A good token betraying the fact that the director does not have any message behind the play is when the actors scream or run about on stage. The weaker the play, the more is the likelihood that you will see lots of screaming and running. I was sitting there like a dummy, staring right in front of me and thinking, will the intermission never come? <sighs> but thank goodness it did come and I hurried off towards the cloakroom. I felt sore at the soul after such a play. Not even close to catharsis, just the opposite. My soul felt desecrated, robbed of something. But still, I decided to experience a positive emotion and steered my course towards a newly opened gigantic shop with a foreign name. Strange it is, but lately I see the same thing everywhere. The food department of that shop was huge, but there were no good and affordable foods there, almost none. A vendor in a marketplace cheating you can be opposed, but an organized and bigger scale trickery like those shopping centers is virtually unassailable. I realized that my search for positive emotion had gone all wrong. Then I decided to have another attempt. I approached the shelves with liver of codfish. I knew that they were counterfeit items mostly, those tins. There could be soft roe inside instead of liver. The liver could be of a rotten looking color not its normal light pink. A large scope of possibilities combined with a low level of morals issues in catastrophe. In the Bible, this tendency is called diabolism. In Russia, it has grown to bloom to its full color. I had made up my mind on the prettiest looking and most expensive tin of cod liver. And when I opened it at home, I realized that my positive emotion thing didn't work again. <laughs> Almost the whole of the liver was black instead of pink. I couldn't help myself to keep from tasting a bit of it. To put it mildly, that liver did not taste good. An interesting tendency, thought I, throwing the tin into the rubbish along with its contents. 
The form is developing and blossoming, while the essence is degrading and withering. See it in a theater building and its play, in a supermarket and tin goods from it. Generally, this is a worldwide trend. To successfully oppose the things you don't like, you have to understand that indignation is pointless. It only gets you diseases. First of all, you have to comprehend that the processes in hand are logical consequences. Seeds once planted shall bring us fruits in the end. And seeds is our lifestyle, our idea of what happiness is. The Bolsheviks thought that man can become happy only if deprived of an individual style of thinking and private property. That idea was the opposite of the capitalist tendency where the scope of man's happiness was limited to providing for his own ego. Selfishness, whether individual or collective, can never make man happy. A head full of rubbish brings on senseless and stupid external actions. Suddenly, I notice that I am feeling more cheerful. <laughs> when you understand that the things in hand are logical. When you understand why it all happened, the understanding makes you armed and prepared to fight the problems of a question. A person operating in extreme ideas, whose happiness is either the individual style of thinking or the collective one, such a person is doomed to be aggressive, for his view of the world is narrow. The correct mindset is dialectic. It combines the two opposites. The correct view of the world is only granted to a person who cares for their soul and makes it their first priority. Soul is the entity harboring love. It is the soul that combines the two opposites at any moment. If, for some reason, the soul stops working correctly, then the person no longer lives by their heart and wisdom. They live by their wit, cunning and passions, and such a mind can never hold the two opposites at once. Such a person has two options. Either they oppress others or they grovel before others. In an undeveloped human community, for example, one with stable pagan concepts, the notions of equality and friendship are impossible, impracticable. As long as you are strong, others stay friendly with you and humor you. If you become weak, they subdue you and make you obey. In principle, this is a normal animal relationship, the struggle for the status of a dominating male. There must be a center in any group of animals. It makes chances of survival stronger. In an animal group, the center is the bossing male. With humans, the pattern is the same. But, given a high level of development, the will of the leader no longer dominates. It is the unifying idea that holds all together. On the levels of body or spirit, a person can be either leading or subordinated. On the level of soul, you can be both leading and subordinated at the same time. <laughs> Any group of people works as an aggregate organism. Such a model gives much better chances for survival and development. But only the highest energy enables one to live by one's heart and soul. It takes a very high intensity of love inside one's soul. A pagan or idolater is unable to start this process. That is why the unity promised by the Bolsheviks never existed in the Soviet Union. 
it was only imitated. Just like the Soviet motto of the friendship of the nations. The real sensation of unity can only arise on the level of soul, because it is there that love dwells. A state with pagan tendencies can be unified through common territory and language, through religion and common aims. An idolater most tends to be unified with their tribe when it falls under a deadly threat of danger. People can also be unified by tempting prospects of gain or by some common aim, but togetherness before the face of death is one of the strongest sensations. That is why there was the constant search for enemies of the people in the Soviet Union and preparation for a new war. Which is also why the United States starts a new local war every five to seven years on average. Winning such a war in any spot on Earth creates an aura of invincibility an image of a strong, protected, and well-doing country. A feeling of righteousness in such a victory is imperative, for it ensures an effective unification of the nation. A defeat is also advantageous. In this case, unification happens automatically, intuitively. Defeat is an impending danger. A lost war not only can unify the people, but give free reign to so-called unpopular directives restraining democracy. After September 11th in the United States, the country synonymous with Western democracy, laws were instituted that surpassed in their stringency even the laws of some totalitarian regimes. A pagan formation is destined to resort to violence, otherwise discipline becomes impossible. And modern progress is suicidal without discipline. Judging by the looks of it, soon the pressure of state control will increase more and more worldwide. Interestingly, there are outward and inward forms of protest. The inner forms are not obvious, not aggressive. Such people do not become terrorists or vandals crashing shop fronts or muggers or killers. The destruction shall turn inside. Desires and intentions will be atrophied inner energy will decrease. Homosexuality, depression, suicide, reluctance to have children, generally all of these things are already facts of life. Many processes that are true of animals are also applicable to humans. Why do female specimens become reluctant to propagate their breed when closed up in a zoo? And what is even less clear, in case the offspring do appear, the females often refuse to feed them, leaving them to die of starvation. What is it that plagues the animals? Why is a basic natural law of survival failing? the instinct for self-reproduction. Our science, our science cannot explain that, because it builds conclusions on the premises of the theory stating that man is physical body only. It is a defective, narrow point of view, which still dominates despite the long-ago discovered facts about the electron being not only a particle, but a wave also. The corollary of the said facts is that any object in the universe is not only of physical nature, but of wave nature also. The inference is simple. 
Any object can be damaged even though being physically whole. There is more to life than physical matter. Damaged field structures inevitably entail destruction of the physical shell. What we call feelings and emotions is connected with field or wave structures which are primordial as compared with physical health of man. In free stretches of wilderness, any animal has to survive and develop. It has to estimate the surroundings and to try to control them. It has to be adapted to the present and the future environment. This necessitates a constant outburst of the creative energy of development. New functions are continually being created functions for better adaptation to the world, and for forecasting, that is, controlling the future. But in small enclosed spaces, these processes do not take place. The inner subtle energy of the animal decreases rapidly. The cubs are born, but their aura is dark. They are devoid of primary strategic energy. They are simply unfit to live. And the entire animal world is subject to natural intuitive selection. A mother will not feed her cub if it has no life in it. If its energy is low, not only will it lose the survival fight, but it will not provide a healthy offspring either, by that spoiling the genetic code of the population. Supporting specimens that are too weak to live will lead to impaired population if they multiply, and the population will perish. In any zoo, even with the conditions of excellent feeding and care, the subtle strategic energy of the animals degrades imperceptibly. Only they that fight for survival, those will survive. A living creature applying more energy and creating new forms of adaptation is more fit to live. 